Welcome back to How Brands Are Built, where branding professionals get into the details of what they do and how they do it. I'm your host, Rob Meyerson. Thanks for listening. Today's episode is brought to you by Squad Help, the world's number one naming platform. To use Squad Help and launch a naming contest today, go to squadhelp.com and start receiving custom name suggestions instantly. Season three featured my most wide-ranging conversations yet. I talked to Jeremy Miller about naming, Anna Angelic about social influence, and Denise Lee Yan about fusing brand and culture. Like last season, I talked to popular authors and speakers, Jeremy, Anna, and Denise, as well as Fabian Gerhalter, and some people I've worked with closely, Ken Pasternak, Karen Williams, Dennis Hahn, Alan Brew, and Myra Elbayumi. Thank you to all my guests this season. And thank you, too, for listening, sharing your thoughts, and following along on the website, social media, and the newsletter. The theme of the season, broadly speaking, was brand experience. So in this wrap-up episode, I'll walk through what a brand experience is and how to create or improve one. First, a little bit of of end-of-season housekeeping. This is the final episode of Season 3, but I haven't run out of ideas for future seasons or interim episodes, so stay tuned. In the meantime, I've been allocating more of my time and energy to written content on the site, HowBrandsAreBuilt.com. It's a lot of my own writing, but I'm also working on getting some great content from others up on the site. Speaking of which, if you'd like to contribute, please get in touch. Lastly, if you're just tuning in for this episode, I hope you like it, and if you do, please leave a rating and review on iTunes, tell someone about the show, and subscribe. With that, let's talk about brand experience. First off, how should we define brand experience? About a year ago, well before this season started, I posted a definition on the How Brands Are Built website. The totality of all sensations, feelings, thoughts, and actions evoked by a brand. And that pretty much aligns with other definitions I've seen from the likes of Marty Neumeyer. Let's listen to a few of this season's guests give their definitions. Here's Ken Pasternak, president of 2x4, and Karen Williams, an independent brand strategist, each going into some detail on how they think about brand experience. Actually, our definition of brand experience has to start with our definition of brand. Mm -hmm. Because, as you know, there there are so (laughs) many different perspectives on that particular word. We define brand as the intersection of promise and perception. Uh, Uh, If you can make a clear and ownable promise to the world, you're going to set certain expectations and you're going to create certain perception. When you deliver on that promise, the expectations are met and your brand starts to take on meaning. It starts to to take on that emotional quality that so many brands, especially um, high-performing brands, are known for. And so brand experience then becomes all the different ways in which you make that promise real. It's in the way you talk about it, it's in your presence across touch points, and it's about the process of successful promise fulfillment when a customer or other stakeholder interacts with you. And so it's kind of evolved from that just, you know, brand being a mark of quality to brand experience being a way in which a promise can actually live out in the real world. I don't actually know what the textbook definition of brand experience is, but I always say it's making it real and actually bringing it to life for your audience, connecting the dots across everything you do. And it has two benefits. The first one is, you know, we could, as brand strategists, we could, we can look at a pyramid or a platform or something and we're like, yes. I totally get it and I know what to do with it. I think a lot of people look at that and they're like, okay, that sounds nice, but I, what do I do? You know, like I've literally had people say, now what do I do? You know? And so brand experience is sort of that next level. It's if this is what defines you as a company or as a brand, if this is your ethos, what is the experience that you want your audience to have? It's not different from that. It's just sort of flip flopping, thinking about who are we? Who am I? Now, what do I want people to experience? You know, if I say, you know, I'm a a really, you know, friendly person, you know, that's, that's me, you know, that I wouldn't say to someone, I'm a friendly person. I would say, (laughs) I'm going to always, you know, greet people by their first name. I'm going to ask them how they're doing, you know, so it's that next, it's like taking it from what does it mean to you? To what does it mean in the world to them in the world? Yeah, to your audience and really connecting the dots. Now that we've heard some definitions, let's talk about how to create a brand experience. Based on all the conversations from this season, it really comes down to four steps. Sounds simple, 
but each step requires some serious work, as you'll hear. Step one, get the brand strategy right. I know, it sounds obvious, but it can't be glossed over. And it's interesting to hear different points of view on whether or how the brand strategy should speak to that eventual brand experience directly. In other words, should we be putting something like experience principles into our strategy platforms? Let's listen to Dennis Hahn, Chief Strategy Officer of Liquid Agency, and you'll get an idea of what I'm talking about. I would say six or seven years ago, we we started stumbling on this need with working with brands like Skype, when we Mm rebranded Skype or Nordstrom, that the experiences that their customers have are the things that actually have the most resonance with what the brand is about, the meaning of the brand. And versus the, the the communications or the other things that you might find in a typical brand platform. So we started to include uh, hooks into the brand platform for uh, experience. And we started okay. with experience principles, which makes a ton of sense because you need principles that guide the experience. But we found that putting the experience principles in the brand platform alongside of expression attributes gets a little confusing because you have two lists of things and sets of principles. And as you know, these things, people have a hard time. What do I do with these? What do I do with those? Wow. So we evolved it and we instead, we have a, an aspiration for the experience, a higher level thing we call ideal brand experience. So that's sort of at the end of the day, this is what the outcome is. This is how we want the audience to feel as a result of having the experience with this brand. So that sort of sits at the top of the food chain, if you will, for experience. Dennis went on to describe an experience principles framework separate from the brand platform. It includes that ideal brand experience as well as experience principles for both employees and customers. Next, we'll hear from Myra El Bayumi, strategy director at Character in San Francisco. We do include almost every time behaviors within our positioning work. So if this is our purpose, if these are the things that we believe, if this is why the world should choose us, how should people behave within the organization to serve that purpose and pursue that purpose? And also along the lines of experience principles, the way you just talked about, how are those behaviors applied to the brand itself? Maybe it's six of one, half dozen of the other, but it sounds like there's no consensus on whether something like experience principles belong within a strategy platform or in some separate framework. Then again, maybe the strategy platform itself is not as relevant as it once was. Here's Alan Brew, founding partner at Branding Business, on corporate narrative, which he calls the evolution of brand positioning. On a communications front, at least, he argues corporate narrative can drive consistent execution across a more diverse set of touch points, presumably without any need for experience principles. At one time, they, it was simpler. I mean, there were certain kinds of execution you couldn't take from that platform, the positioning platform. Mm-hmm. What has happened is the need for greater traction. The whole concept of positioning has, has morphed into how do we tell us, you know, on the basis of this research and the basis of this positioning platform, what is the story we tell externally? What do we do with this? How do we use this in our, in our marketing, in our corporate communications, right. in our speeches, in our publications? What, is the, what are the components of the narrative that we need to be building into everything we communicate with? So it's become more of a, a, a fungible, externalized set of strategic components rather than just this inert right. strategic document that lives on somebody's shelf. No matter what form your strategy takes, there's broad alignment that it needs to be complete and well thought through before starting to work on the experience. A big thank you to Squad Help, who once again has sponsored not only this episode, but this entire season of How Brands Are Built. Squad Help is the world's number one naming platform. Here's how it works. You launch a naming contest to engage hundreds of naming experts. You're guided through an agency-level naming process that goes beyond traditional crowdsourcing. The platform uses AI and includes name validation features such as audience testing, trademark validation, linguistic analysis, and quality scoring. And Squad Help doesn't just do naming. You can also use their platform for taglines or slogans as well as logo design. To launch your naming contest today, go to squadhelp.com and start receiving custom name suggestions instantly. Squad Help, company, brand, and business name ideas by experts. This episode is also brought to you by Rev.com, offering fast, affordable, accurate audio transcriptions and captions. 
I like to use Rev to transcribe episodes of this podcast, but also when I'm doing brand strategy projects and record interviews with stakeholders, I'll use Rev to transcribe those interviews. I've tried a few other services and I keep coming back to Rev. Their transcriptions are the most accurate I've seen, their turnaround time is less than 24 hours sometimes, and transcriptions cost just $1 a minute. Right now, Rev is offering listeners of this show $10 off your first order. So to get that $10 off coupon, visit rev.com slash blog slash HBAB for how brands are built. Again, that's rev.com slash blog slash HBAB. Rev, transcriptions made simple. Today's podcast is also brought to you by Audible. This season, I interviewed three authors, Jeremy Miller, Fabian Gerhalter, and Denise Leon. Each of them has written two books about branding. If you like this podcast, I think you'll like their books. And some of them are available as audiobooks. For listeners of How Brands Are Built, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. So to download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash H-B-A-B for How Brands Are Built. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash H-B-A-B to get your free audiobook. Now, back to the season three wrap up. And that gets us to step two outline the context within which the brand will be experienced. Here's Jeremy Miller, founder of Sticky Branding and author of Brand New Name, and Karen Williams again, each describing a straightforward way of considering context. It's the customer journey, it's journey mapping. Mm -hmm. So, what you're looking at is from the customer's life cycle from the purchase behavior through to how they become a customer to how they leave you is mapping out what are those critical engagement points. Now let's make a list of all, you know, as many as we can think of our core kind of customer interaction points, or as you would call them, touch points. Let's make a list of all of those. Where do we want, you know, someone to experience the brand? Where do we want the brand to show up? We literally just make a list of those. Sometimes it's a worksheet. Sometimes it's on a whiteboard, you know, for a video or using some sort of Google Sheets or something. But a customer journey map isn't the only way to think about context. Anna Angelic, strategy executive and doctor of sociology, and Denise Leon, best-selling author of What Great Brands Do and Fusion, each presented different approaches. Anna, who you'll hear first, talked about the brand in the context of culture and competition. Once you define that promise by looking at what are the values of the company first, then you're looking what is happening in culture, what are the conversations. Is wellness important right now and self-care and maybe unplugging and slowing down or, or you know, what, what is, is travel? Like what is important in culture mm-hmm. right now? What is that conversation? Then you look again and what is the category doing or where, where do the best practices come from? Maybe they come outside of category and then why? And Denise talked about a tool she uses to organize touch points based on who's responsible for them within an organization. The brand touch point wheel is a tool that I use with my clients to identify all of those touch points, all of the different ways that someone from the outside world experiences your brand. And then the wheel, you know, it kind of looks like almost like concentric circles where the inner circles describe the departments or the groups or the functions within your organization that lead up to or are responsible for those for those touch points. And so the tool becomes not only identifying what those touch points are and identifying who's responsible, but then it can be used as a tool for or prioritizing, optimizing, and then ultimately kind of tracking improvements and tracking performance across those touch points. Okay. So once you've outlined that context, whether it's a journey map, an examination of relevant cultural trends, something like the brand touch point wheel or all of the above, it's time to start brainstorming ideas for the brand experience. And that is step three. Here's Ken Pasternak again, explaining the basic premise. When you have a clear promise, you can deliver a, a, develop a long list of ideas very quickly. You think about audience, you think about touch points, you think about product, you think about customer journey and where you're actually engaging with the customer. And you can develop a long list, and it's good to keep a long list because mm-hmm. you want to see the kind of the universe of possibilities. And once again, Myra El Bayumi talking about one of the ways this brainstorming often takes place in a collaborative workshop with the client. 
I think what becomes even more exciting is when we do these activation workshops, which we don't do every time, but whenever we can. And a lot of shops do something similar where we actually bring our clients in once we've nailed the positioning, maybe we've nailed the other pieces as well, or maybe we're earlier in the process and we sort of set up stations in, in our conference room or whatever space we happen to be in that are reflective of specific channels or important touch points for that brand. Okay. And we go around, set up, you know, huge cross-functional teams from the client side, our entire cross-functional team who's worked on it and brainstorm the implications of the positioning on each of these things. So while we may not actually do influencer strategy, we do plenty of brainstorming on what social media should look like and what are the types of influencers we would want to work with. What are the implications for how the experience should come to life in a retail environment. Karen Williams described a similar kind of workshop and provided a few tips on what to do if people are having trouble coming up with original ideas for the brand. If people are stuck, sometimes I'll say, all right, let's take, I'm just taking an example, your landing page, you know, how do we want to change this so that it, you know, really represents the brand that we've just created? And let's say the ideas are kind of like, oh, I don't know, you know, I'm kind of thinking about normal things or nothing really inspirational coming up. You can say, okay, what would be the worst home, you know, worst landing page that we could come up with that would really just not represent the brand? And for some reason, it's easier. You know, it's like when you ask someone right. a question, they're like, well, I don't know what I want to do, but I know what I don't want to do, you know, and So that's a nice way. And you take that and you say, now what's the opposite of that? So there's different ways, like just sort of creative brain games where you can get to the end result without just saying, what should this look like based on the brand? What should this look like based on the brand? Another way is just sort of not putting so much pressure on one person or one team to come up with something. So you may say, okay, you guys take people and you can brainstorm around this area. And then then you take their ideas and you pass them to the next group or to another person and let them kind of build. Another way to spur thinking, which Karen just alluded to, is to think of touch points in categories. At Interbrand, where Karen and I work together, we talked about people, places, products, and communications. You could even create a matrix with these four categories against the customer journey. As an example, taking a step like point of purchase in a retail shop, say, what does the customer experience in terms of the people they interact with, the feel of the store or the checkout counter, the product they're about to purchase, and the communications that they see at the register? Once you've got your long list of ideas, you can move to the final step. Step four, implement, measure, and modify. How do you decide which ideas to implement first? Here's Ken Pasternak once again, talking about a simple framework to organize your ideas. Then there's a particular tool that's very simple again, but I've found very effective in prioritizing the elements that will most effectively help you orchestrate a brand experience. It's, a, it's just a two-by-two two matrix. And on one axis, you have low impact and high impact. Uh-huh. And on the other axis, you have low effort and high effort. And you begin to map out all those possibilities that you've just listed into that matrix. So you're going to have you know, low effort, high impact possibilities. You're going to have high effort, high impact possibilities. Right. You're going to have low effort, low impact, and high effort, low impact. And if you think about it, that high effort, low impact category are things that come off the list really quickly (laughs) because they're time and resource intensive and they don't really make much of a difference. Right. And so you're able to begin to focus in. Both Dennis Hahn and Fabian Gerhalter, principal at Finian, talked about prototyping the ideas, which is a relatively low effort, low cost way of thinking through which ideas will work best and getting client buy-in. You may remember prototyping as a theme from season two. Here's Fabian talking about what his firm chooses to prototype or mock up. That changes really from client to client. So usually mm-hmm. some things are standard, right? What does a client need to launch? They, they need an email signature. They need a business card. They need a landing page of sorts. They need, you know, iconography. They need patterns. You know, they, they need, a, they need a, a visual language. They, they need social media, right? So we don't, we actually don't set up the social media accounts, but we fake their accounts. So we say, right. here would be the first six Instagram tiles. Here's how you use the images. Here's what type of, you know, of, of quotes you would use, or here, here's what you would do with Instagram. And here's the, the, the text that you would actually use for it. So we write mm-hmm. little bits of copy, but it changes completely from client to client. So I asked them before the face, I'm like, look, you're in fashion. So I guess we're going to do hang tab tags and we're going to do labels or or you're a startup, this is a new business for you, we need to create pitch decks, or 
Right. You know, if you e-commerce, we're going to do fun packing tapes or like cool carts, you know, that we throw into the order or, you know, so it's really, that's where, that's where we get to have fun. Lastly, Jeremy Miller provided a much needed reminder. If you really want a killer brand experience, you can't afford to think of it as a one-time creation. It's about constant measurement and refinement. I think of the total brand experience and the total customer experience as total quality management. Everything that you create in the planning stage or at the boardroom is a hypothesis. Until you get it out into the world and get data, get customer feedback, and actually see what moves the sales needle, then you're not really getting anything validated. So when you look at the total customer experience, it is a, it's a living strategy. It is constantly evolving. You're constantly improving. You're responding to what's going on in the marketplace. So there you have it. Four steps to create and maintain a great brand experience. One, get the brand strategy right. Two, outline the context within which the brand will be experienced. Three, brainstorm ideas for the brand experience. And four, implement, measure, and modify. Easy, right? (laughs) Maybe easier said than done. I'll leave you with a couple of final reminders from this season's guest. First is that it is possible to overthink brand experience, to overdo it. Don't take this process so far that your brand feels like it's trying too hard to create an experience. Second, and relatedly, make sure your ideas are more than skin deep. Think about actions and behaviors just as much, if not more than, words and images. How will the brand strategy be substantiated? How will it be baked into the company's culture at the deepest levels? Keep these steps and bits of advice in mind as you're creating or working on your brand, and you'll have a head start on creating a top-notch brand experience. That's it for this wrap-up episode and for season three, but there's plenty more where this came from. If you want more, I highly recommend listening to each episode from this season or reading the transcripts on HowBrandsAreBuilt.com. On the site, you'll find plenty of additional written content about brand strategy, naming, brand architecture, all your favorite topics to nerd out on, as well as a fully updated list of books recommended by guests from this season and last season. Thanks again for listening, and especially to those of you who I'm beginning to think of as How Brands Are Built insiders, those of you who've subscribed and signed up for the newsletter, who comment and connect constantly on social media, and have maybe even left a rating and review on iTunes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If you're not an insider yet, it's not too late. And who knows, maybe I'll even eventually make the insider thing something official, in which case you'll be first in line for some insider-only treats. So please, subscribe, leave a rating and review, and stay in touch. I appreciate it. How Brands Are Built is a production of Heirloom Agency, LLC. Our theme music is by Isha Erskine Project. I'm Rob Meyerson, and I'll talk to you next time. Music